the topic today on Laptop Radio is Combating Addiction with Data and Empathetic Tech. And we have Daniela Luz Petita on the phone. And she's the founder and CEO of WeConnect. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Daniela Tudor. I am the uh, founder and CEO of WeConnect. And what we've built is a platform to do two things. One, to prevent folks from relapsing and helping them have sustained recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. And then the second piece of that is providing the entire healthcare ecosystem that is dealing with addiction true verified outcomes data, which is really important in this field. Awesome. And what is your background? Yeah, so my background um, is a little bit mixed. Uh, my career started um, in building uh, system engineering teams as well as software development teams for big companies like Microsoft, Union Bank, and IT departments of major motion picture studios. And then I've also had um, entrepreneurial ventures before this one. One of them was in the music industry space. Another one was in the music technology space. And through that journey of entrepreneurship and technology, I knew that my career would continue on that path. And then uh, what really hit the nail on the head for me to start a venture like We Connect and transition though uh, industries in terms from going to music and technology into healthcare and technology was my personal experience with addiction. And can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about WeConnect and what it's doing now and what are some of your short-term and long-term goals and impact that you guys are looking to make? Totally. Um, so just to back up a little bit and how WeConnect got started for context, I, as I mentioned, this is very personal to me. So uh, over four years ago, my best friend, um, who's my best friend now, Adrian, and uh, she was my co-founder for my venture prior to this, she helped me realize that I needed to get into recovery uh, from my addiction. And so I didn't know a lot about the space. I didn't know recovery resources were available. I also was just not aware of um, even therapy practices or anything that was out there that could help. And so I tried to get healthy on my own and stop my drug and alcohol addiction. And as I've come to find out, recovery doesn't work without community. And it doesn't work without love and empathy and also all of the great healthcare resources that have been developed to date to treat addiction. And so after 18 months of trying to stop on my own, I landed in treatment. And it was there that I found out a couple key things. One, that the relapse rate is alarmingly high, which that there's 80% um, relapse for folks, particularly um, in the first 90 days of recovery after inpatient treatment. And then I also looked around when I was in rehab and I saw just counselors and staff members, you know, having so much on their plate, a lot of things still being done on paper or legacy software platforms. So I just saw a lot of opportunity there to both help individuals stay in long-term recovery and not relapse, but also really help the entire system end-to-end -to, -end to do better with outcomes data and big data and really improve the treatment system, which ultimately helps the customer. And so uh, when I got out, I thought that I would look at research, peer-reviewed research on relapse um, prevention, as well as um, talked to professionals in the space, and we interviewed 200 people in recovery and looked at whether my hypothesis that lack of accountability to the treatment plan, which is a piece of paper with a number of activities that you have to do on a daily basis to, um, to help um, folks stay in recovery, as well as connection to your support community were the two drivers of relapse. And so Based on that hypothesis that after doing this research and looking at current research was proven, we went out and we created our first product, which is the WeConnect mobile application. And um, when we created this application, which does a combination of things, it helps you stay connected in real time to your community. We also digitized something in the uh, behavioral health space called contingency management, which is a, a way of combining gamification and a reward system in the app to help people stay motivated and on track with their treatment plan, um, as well as the ability to track all of your recovery activities in the app. Once we created this mobile app and we released it into the market and we work with treatment centers and drug courts and um, other institutions, 
we realized that there was that big data problem, which is that up until we came along, a lot of rehab facilities would simply um, give one phone call to the patient a year and then punt that back to the insurance company or the accreditation firm and say, hey, we have verified outcomes on the relapse rate, which with that little of data and also self-reporting data, it's not really possible to provide good outcomes. And so we created an additional product, which is our data dashboard, that in real time, along with our patent pending relapse risk score algorithm, can tell um, the entire healthcare ecosystem that population's health and how they're progressing throughout their, uh, their recovery continuum. So we've created those two products along with our relapse uh, risk score algorithm, and we're just really excited to release the new version of our products over the next couple of weeks. A lot of love and thought and work, hard work has gone from all of our team members that we connect and all of our partners that have helped with it. So we're really excited to see how we can grow and continue to impact um, this population that is really touching the lives of most families in America, quite frankly. So. I wanted to talk a little bit about addiction. I'm a little bit um, familiar with it. So um, in, in terms of addiction, um, there is a cycle um, of addiction. And, and the first one is really the wounds that we, we experience as, you know, as a child and our belief system and shame. And, you know, mm-hmm. and then it goes to a really cycle of like, you know, triggered and obsession and then ritualization and then acting out you know and then it goes back to despair you know and then shame again you know can you Mm -hmm. really talk a little bit about that cycle and how your product could help folks who are fighting it totally and what you described is definitely a part of um, the vast subject of addiction which is a biopsychosocial condition, and so it spans across uh, multiple sectors that include, you know, there's the psychology, psychological, psychological part, the so, uh, social aspect, and then of course the physiological um, healthcare condition. And so the piece that you're referring to is very important. Um, what I refer to it as, and what experts in the field refer to it as, is really the um, uh, childhood uh, traumas that occur and then how that develops into a cycle um, of addiction and shame is certainly a big part of it. And so we actually um, thought about that and really looked at research, particularly University of Washington has done great research around digital applications, specifically in behavioral health. And then we also looked at research around gamification and we've done focus groups around how can we provide messaging in the app that is loving and encouraging and shame free. So we didn't just think about how we would address this from a messaging perspective, but also in the app, if you do experience a relapse event and you come back to the application, we actually really want to celebrate that. We want to celebrate you coming back and uh, starting over on day one and re-engaging with your peers in your recovery. And we want to celebrate that courage. And so the way that we do that is you don't lose all of the points and you don't lose the rewards that you've already accumulated, but rather we really celebrate you for taking this big step and re-engaging in your recovery. So that's, I think, one of the really important pieces of how we're addressing this. Personally, one of my goals with building this company isn't just to impact the relapse rate and help families heal, but overall to destigmatize addiction and bring a greater understanding to it. What are some of the most common addictions, you know, off tech and also on tech? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes. Uh, what are the what are some of the most popular addictions? Most popular addictions, I mean, currently, um, as I'm sure that, you know, a lot of our listeners are familiar with on the news, the opioid epidemic is taking more lives than the Vietnam War um, or the AIDS epidemic. Um, And those deaths are happening every hour of every day. So the opioid epidemic is certainly, in terms of looking at the death toll, um, I would say one of the most common ones today. But I would also say that there is this underlying effect of alcoholism 
that has sort of gone under the radar because of the opioid epidemic and the toll that it's taken. And what I mean by that is if you look at alcohol consumption and alcohol addiction, oftentimes, um, as research has shown, is that alcohol is a as a driver and cause to other diseases, to heart disease, liver disease, um, oh, you know, it's a factor in obesity, just a number of other life altering conditions. And so if we're looking at for other pervasive addictions that are really um, taking uh, a lot of health and um, causing a lot of um, damage to family systems, I would say alcohol is also one of the most common ones, but it's gone a little bit under the radar because of the opioid epidemic. There is also a third one um, that I personally am seeing growth in, and I think in the future, uh, we connect as a company is going to take a look at how we can impact this. But certainly technology and screen addiction um, or video gaming addiction and those things are also um, is on the increase. And then another common one that I think um, doesn't get talked about enough is, is eating disorders. Eating disorders are actually a form of addiction. Um, if you're looking at the cycle of highs and lows and, and binging and some of these other factors, eating disorders is also classified as an addiction. So I believe that's also a very common one statistically. Awesome. Um, how about processing addiction? You know, like work addiction, sex addiction, um, and basically addictions that require some kind of process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so eating disorders is um, bundled under that category. Process addictions, I think, especially when somebody has an over -addict addiction like drug or alcohol, there's always going to be a process addiction, particularly codependency. I, I believe um, from the research that I've looked at and the sources that um, I've read both just for personal growth, but also from a scientific standpoint as we grow our company, um, codependency is probably the most common one. Uh, sex is certainly also a, a large addiction um, that is out there, but I think it's still a bit more taboo in terms of talking about it, though I see all addictions having similar roots as well as similar solutions. And so um, the root and the solution is very similar, but the symptom of that can have varying colors and shapes and sizes when you're looking from gambling to sex to codependency, which I believe is the most common one. Um, I wanted to go into codepen codependency a lot, you know, because <laughs> we hear the term, but really don't know what it means. So what mm -hmm. does codependency mean? And, you know, and how do we become less codependent? <laughs> that is such a great question, and I'm actually so excited that you're taking the conversation to this. Um, just knowing your incredible vast background in technology and just uh, hearing that you're also up on this topic is really incredible. You're, you're such an amazing person. Um, but so codependency is not what most, I think the typical person that has never dug into it, they assume that codependency means that um, you are, you know, overly attached and let's say texting the person you're dating every single minute and all that stuff. But codependency is actually much more than that. And there's particular subcategories. So codependency essentially means that you are in an addictive way attached to people, places, or things. But the method that shows that, that dysfunction or attachment that is not quite uh, balanced, and it's at the detriment of your own personal health um, and those sorts of things, is different than one might traditionally think of codependence. So codependence can be in that form where uh, you are basically putting another person before your own health, and you are trying to take care of them above your own needs so that you're not actually dealing with what's going on inside of you. But there's also other categories of codependence. One is avoidance, so it's actually the opposite. It's when um, this flavor of codependence can be defined by, you know, not wanting to interact, lacking intimacy skills, um, not being able to foster relationships in a healthy way. So it's the other extreme of what I just described. Then there's two more subcategories of codependence. One is denial um, patterns, so that can take the form of um, you know, uh, lying so that you protect your own feelings or fears, um, denying reality. So say that, you know, commonly somebody in an abusive relationship, denying the fact that that's what's actually happening or excusing the behavior for long periods of time. 
And then the third one is compliance behaviors, which is really um, in layman's terms, people pleasing. So getting gifts, not because you want to genuinely give that gift to the person, but you want to do it because you want to hear the feedback and the validation that comes from from doing that. So those are the sort of four subcategories of codependence that I don't think traditionally people think about. Yeah, um, and, and I read that if you're codependent, your reaction to things are very extreme um, mm -hmm. and your communication with people are quite different. Right? Um, so the, the connection, um, you know, like I, I think there's a school of thought that, you know, if there is a connection, with people, the addiction may go away. And so I wanted to dive a little bit deeper in core beliefs um, because I think that's very important. I, I just feel that a lot of people who are, who are addicted to something, you know, has that emptiness or despair, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and so why, right? Why do we have these core beliefs that wound us? And how do we, how do we know you know, like if we're just kind of go to work, go to school, you know, how do we know that these these beliefs are inside of us? You know, because I feel like discovery and awareness is really important because if we are not aware or even realize that there is like something that we wanted to improve in ourselves, we would not change. Right. So if you're mm -hmm. listening, if we're listening to you right now and, you know, we're just basically normal, we go to school, we go home, we hang out with our friends. You know, how do we know that subconsciously we have these core beliefs that affect us on how, you know, just really on our being and how we make decisions? Totally. I mean, I think that's such a complicated question and there's different angles, kind of like, you know, a cereal box. There's just a lot of different ways that we can look and analyze it. Um, one of the things that I've I've given a lot of thought to and I hope that we can uh, create a program around this, but I think one way to do preventative work around that stuff is certainly growing mindfulness in our school systems, um, making it more of a not punitive but safe environment so that the kids trust qualified counselors at the school. And then I think from a fundamental society, societal aspect, there's a couple changes or improvements that I think we could make that wouldn't take a ton of effort, but could make a huge impact in sort of preventing from unhealthy core beliefs from being instilled um, in us as kids. Mm -hmm. One of them, one of the things that I hope to do in the future is to create short video content, even 30 second snippet of a video that could um, teach parents uh, from all socioeconomic uh, facets of how to make their kids feel loved and connected. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at research that shows that kids or humans, actually, there's 13 different types of intelligence. Uh, one can be artistic, one can be athletic, one can be academic. And I think oftentimes, especially in the Western society, we're pushing the academic side of it and we're saying, if you don't do good in school, you're gonna be successful in life. And if you're not doing good in school, we're gonna make you feel bad and shamed about it. But if parents were to take a step back and recognize where is my son or daughter intelligent, like what area out of those 13 areas are they intelligent and how can I make them feel fulfilled in that and connected in that emotionally and say a couple phrases here and there every other day that makes them feel a little bit more connected, I think that can sprout the seed of, of self-love um, and those healthy coping mechanisms. But also, again, I think we're only looking at one segment of cause of addiction. There's a physiological aspect. There's um, other things that we don't know yet about addiction that I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that addressing this piece of it, which is like childhood trauma or core belief that you grow up with, would completely solve it. I think there's a lot more that we need to do, a lot more research that needs to go into it. But certainly, I think doing things where parents can recognize where their child is actually intelligent and showing just saying words of affirmation that are really seem really small and trivial but very important could help on the preventative side. Um, I think as a society, if we're not able to get to the prevention side and we're more in the stage of like, okay, now they're teenagers or they're going off to college and these core beliefs have already been instilled and imprinted, I believe we need to have to, we have to continue to have programs in society where it's safe to be vulnerable and it's encouraged to take care of your mental health just as you would of your nutrition. 
Um, and then you can start having and going on your own growth journey because everybody has a different kind of journey when it comes to this stuff. And the people that hit bottom can go different ways with it. They can go to EMDR therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or they can start meditating and going to yoga and going on a spiritual journey. And those things can transform those core beliefs and provide healing. But, uh, but I think making it an environment as a society and the workplace, as well as in schools, that taking care of your mental health is just as important and just as celebrated as going to exercise after work, going to the gym or eating healthy, then I think we can start treating um, the lives of those who've already been imprinted and we can't do anything about the preventative side. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about rock bottom and hitting rock bottom. You know, mm-hmm. um, so sometimes that's what it takes for folks to change and sometimes, you know, it, it just doesn't work. Um, so, like, what are, you know, like, if, if I were, you know, I can talk possibly better if I give this example, you know, like, uh, so, you know, there, uh, I guess, you know, people who, you know, uh, were caught, um, taking drugs, right, and they were fired from their work, you know, and then they became homeless. Is that an example Mm -hmm. of, like, hitting rock bottom? Or, you know, someone is really addicted to sex, you know, and they harass a coworker and they got fired, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, so what are, how, do, how should people deal with, you know, where can people find help when they hit rock bottom? Yeah, so I think before the resources, I think there's a really important um, kind of clarity around rock bottom that, given the resources that we have today, the image of rock bottom is actually taking many forms. So I think, you know, in the back in the 1930s when 12-step programs were just starting to flourish, rock bottom really meant like you were homeless, jobless, you were in stage four of alcoholism. There was, you know, you were basically having delirium tremens. You were shaking if you weren't drinking. Today, because there's resources, because of technology, because of the way how we live, Rock bottom can take many forms, and I believe that on the inside it feels exactly the same, but on the outside it can look different. So I've seen, you know, 18-year-olds walk in the rooms of 12-step meetings um, that have quote-unquote hit rock bottom, which really meant that they got in a little bit of trouble with their parents, and they got sent to rehab, but ultimately they realized they were an addict. Um, Rock bottom can also look like, you know, getting one DUI, and somebody now is open to going to a 12-step meeting, and they realize, like, Oh, I be I I behave the same as anybody else that's an that's an addict or an alcoholic, but I haven't quite lost the house or the car, but I'm still going to get into addiction or get into recovery. So I think that rock bottom has changed to where it feels the same on the inside for every single person. It's really just you can't live with the substances and you can't live without them anymore. That's that's what I consider rock bottom, and it looks different on the outside. When somebody hits that point where they feel like I can't use more drugs and alcohol, but I also, where I can't, you know, I'm, I'm losing everything, I'm getting in trouble for this and that, um, or I just, I'm sick and tired of feeling sick and tired, and you know, again, doesn't mean that they've lost things on the outside, but they just feel that they need help. There's a number of things that they can do. I would say the easiest, most free, most accessible um, form of treatment is uh, to start is you can go to support group meeting because there you can get other resources. Um, One doctor, he's a a neurologist, but he's also an addiction specialist, Corey Waller. He's from the East Coast. He said that addiction is the only place where you can get treatment for it 24-7 anywhere in the world because support groups are out there. And so I think that would be the, the one of the first steps, depending on what stage you're at. Um, you can also access your local detox, which oftentimes can take you in. But I think what's hyper important in that moment of when somebody is hitting rock bottom is that they get the long-term resources, not just the short-term fix of a detox or one meeting, because then it's easy for denial to kick back in and next thing you know, you're, you're back out. So I really recommend um, long-term programs um, that offer a combination of the community support approach aspect, but also clinically evidence-based research uh, practices like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, 
and other forms of treatment. And then what's hyper important, uh, not just because We Connect is known for offering this, but the aftercare is really important. One mistake that we're making as a society right now with addiction is that we're treating it like an acute model of disease, which means that we go into detox or you go into 28-day treatment, and then there's not enough focus on the years after that. And addiction is a chronic illness that requires daily treatment, whether that's meditation or yoga or therapy or whatever it is that you're doing. For a lifetime, you have to be um, practicing your recovery activities and the shift needs to go from acute to chronic illness treatment in order to uh, really give people the long-term solutions that they need. Awesome. Um, how about like triggers? And you know, usually, you know, when when even if you're trying to recover, you know, oftentimes you get triggered by certain emotions or stress. You know, mm -hmm. a fight with friends, you know, or your loved ones, um, certain music. Um, you know, memory or just spacing out, you know, just issues with money, you know, how does, how does, how do, how do we um, deal with like triggers? Um, do we meditate? Do we, you know, talk to our friends and reach out to the community? Yeah, so it, it just depends what works for the individual, but absolutely what you mentioned is, um, is great. I think, um, it just depends on the individual, as you mentioned. Meditation is good. Um, calling somebody or even just text messaging someone to give you that extra 30 seconds to minute of pause mm -hmm. um, can often alleviate that trigger. Now, it also depends. I think early in recovery, it's important to remove the triggers that were there before as much as possible until you get time between day one of recovery and day 365 our chairman of the board, who's you know incredible investor and mentor, but he's also 33 years in recovery, he talks about how our app is really adding additional moments of consciousness so that by day 365 of staying uh, abstinent from drugs or alcohol or whatever the addiction is, you're making much better decisions and the time frame between trigger and acting on the trigger morphs into more of a fleeting thought or it's not as potent as it was on that first day. So I think initially early in recovery, removing yourself from the environment of the triggers is important. With time, you can get adjusted to being in the same environment but not feeling triggered. But early on, I think it's important to both remove the trigger and practice meditation or calling somebody or um, turning your attention to reading a piece of uh, inspirational recovery literature. Whatever those tools are in your toolbox, um, going to you know the prescribed recovery activities um, that are in your treatment plan whatever that looks like but also removing the environment early on is very important after that you can sort of go back to the old environment and the triggers won't be as potent super awesome um and how is how is the we connect community how does that work um you know i mean if if i'm really um you know i mean i feel like with addiction, there's a lot of shame and guilt, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, like, are people judgmental, you know, I'm a little, you know, if, if people are really afraid of signing up, you know, what could they do? And, and how does that work? You know? Yeah. So privacy is hyper important um, at WeConnect, and we've got a great chief compliance and privacy officer who has shepherded us into though we are as a digital application in the gray space, she's shepherded us into being on the very, very um, safe side of, you know, putting privacy as a very important core uh, belief of ours and practice. Um, we are actually HIPAA compliant on both platforms. And um, if you, when you sign up for WeConnect, one of, the tr one of our treatment programs that's a partner or any of the other channels available, um, the individual is actually not searchable on the app. So nobody can search for you on the app. Nobody can find you. Um, the only way that you can connect to somebody else on the app is if you know them and you invite them to join you on the app and that person confirms. And then within that relationship, you can see each other's progress. Mm -hmm. So you can see all of your friends and peers and progress. You can also connect to family members who simply want to support you and stay accountable. 
but and so that there's that community aspect and we are looking at opening up the community aspect just a little bit more but very much in the right way again we want to protect people's privacy and making sure that they're comfortable we also don't share anybody's data outside to what they're consenting which is their data being shared with that third-party treatment center or channel um, that they're signing up through so we're very very protective of data and um, you know, everybody's identity is private on the uh, application in terms of it does not get publicly shared. There, it's not a searchable app. It's not like um, a social media app where you can just look somebody up. Mm-hmm. Do you guys also meet physically, or is it um, more of an online community? It's an online community on the mobile app. Um, okay. We are thinking farther down the line um, as our you know, community is growing that we'll have, you know, some fun events like we brainstorm music festival or community meetups and things like that for those in recovery. So we are uh, brainstorming what that would look like in terms of physically being able to bring our communities together across the country and beyond. Um, But for now, it is um, on the mobile application. Okay. And I wanted to ask you, you know, the, the differences and similarities between the CHELSEP program and reconnect i'm i'm sure there are like a number of differences and similarities but you know i think it will be useful if you know people have knowledge of you know how this community is different from the other one yeah so we connect the mobile app is a digital platform and a framework to empower the individual to stay accountable to whatever program they're a part of So if they do practice the 12 steps, they can stay accountable and check into the 12 step meetings that they're attending and their peers that they're connected to on the mobile app can see their progress and how they're staying accountable to it. Um, If someone practices Celebrate Recovery, which is Christian based or Refuge Recovery, which is Buddhism based, they essentially can use our platform to stay accountable to any of those programs or meetings. So we connect, you can think of it as the parent framework that empowers the individual to stay accountable to and track attending any of these programs, whether it be Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or um, Refuge Recovery, as I mentioned, or some other program that's more therapy-based. So We Connect really is the framework by which they can stay connected 24-7 and then also stay accountable to the program that they choose. Before we move into the challenges that you face as an entrepreneur and um, also in the addiction space, I wanted to ask you like a question that I'm really curious about. Is weed addictive? So I believe that anything can be become addictive and detrimental. I go back to what qualifies somebody to um, be addicted, which is, At its very basic root, two questions. Once you start using it, um, are you having trouble controlling the use? Um, And again, this can be with process addictions as well. And then beyond that, is it affecting your daily, your capability to operate normally in your life? Are you changing commitments as a result? Are you failing to meet your own goals? And then the third question is, do you feel guilt and shame the next morning after using or the next hour after engaging in that behavior? So um, I've seen folks who attend Marijuana Anonymous meetings who have experienced addiction with it. I've also seen marijuana do some incredible things in terms of um, healthcare, medical marijuana, and really help people with chronic pain or cancer and other conditions. And so, again, for me, I don't make a judgment on whether something is quote unquote good or bad or addictive or not addictive. It more the question goes back to the individual and. What is your motive and behavior around said thing, in this case, weed? And is it affecting you in those ways? And if so, then you may consider it as addictive for that individual. Um, If not, then no. Um, I've seen research um, and commentary, of course, where it's a a heavy debate. Um, But again, for me, I, I don't really take opinion in that debate one side or the other, whether marijuana is good or bad but um, again I go back to the individual if it's done something positive for their life or if it's detrimental for their life and then I would encourage them to make choices based on that yeah I've I've known situations where you know once you have an addiction you you just you know some people basically like someone with a porn addiction basically would just really stay inside the house and never go out because you know they're just so drawn to that right 
So, you know, I guess even if we, you know, if you can't really live your life and you're really dependent on it, then I think it changes or the, it could be a degree, right? Um, so what are some of the challenges that you are facing as an entrepreneur in this space? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I don't think any of my challenges are very different from other entrepreneurs, but, um, you know, there's obviously the balancing act between um, being the CEO of the company and then also balancing expectations from shareholders and then making sure that the two are married in alignment. I'm very blessed in the fact that our shareholders are very passionate about what we're doing. They're very supportive. And so I have a great relationship on both sides and we've got a group of people that are really amazing, but I think, um, you know, managing expectations from sort of every single stakeholder is very challenging. Um, with technology, there's always surprises, especially when you are releasing a suite of products and a true platform. It's not that we've just released one product into the wild. It's a number of services and products that are all married together to create the entire platform to service the businesses as well as the end customer. Um, so there's always um, technology challenges that we're facing. Um, and then there's always the growing pains. I compare growing a company just like, you know, having a baby and we're at the teenager stage and then there's growing pains along the way in terms of scalability and all of those things. But I think one of the most beautiful things about our company is that uh, we've created a culture of safety and no shame internally for us as well. And then more importantly, a culture of vulnerability. So people feel really open about not just being honest about what's going on in their in their lives so we know how to all work better together, but people are very quick to communicate about um, challenges that they're having um, and they feel safe doing that. And ultimately, I believe that that's what gets us through all of the obstacles and bumps that we face. Um, I think also, you know, being a woman in the entrepreneurial space has had its challenges. I think. Uh, it's really good that this is a topic that's being frequently talked about today. And I think um, I'm very hopeful and optimistic that the tide will change and that the investment landscape will will continue to grow and uh, be fair and equitable um, and really make a bet on the entrepreneur in the business versus having it be a gender issue. As you know, that's been a very hot topic the last couple of years. Um, so I would say those are generally like the challenges that that I'm facing, but like with any challenges, there's solutions and there's ways around it through them over it. And um, I think that I have a great team around me of mentors that helps us uh, navigate all those things. Okay. And then also uh, with uh, shame and despair and, you know, after, after a certain fantasy, um, what, you know, I, I mean, I read a lot of Brene Brown and she talks about, you know, being authentic and being whole, you know, and, and mm -hmm. not afraid of shame, you know, how, what, what is shame and, and how do you think people can fight it? Um, can you repeat that question again? Yeah. So what is shame? What does shame mean and guilt? And how do we, how do we, you know, fight it? You know, I, I think, you know, someone said mm -hmm. that if you, you know, I think there's a difference when someone, you know, did something, you know, it can be, they can, like, basically, if someone doesn't take out the trash, for example, right? You know, it's <laughs> it could be a back action, you know, but should we, you know, but the shame when is when you call this person lazy, right? So, right. you know, I think there's really a big difference between shame and guilt and, you know, and how do we, how do we fight that? Yeah, so I, you know, I think you're alluding to this, which is uh, absolutely on track and on point, um, which is that uh, it all depends on how we speak to each other and how we communicate to each other. At the core, we're all children that want to be loved and validated and feel like we are of value, right? And so, and I also believe that for the majority of the, for the most part, when people make decisions that appear um, to be negative or not up to standards, it's number one, what I gravitate to every single time is like, I did not get that person enough resources or information of the why I need X, Y, and Z done or why it should be executed at this level. I default to that. So I think in the work environment, that's super important of like, 
if someone makes a mistake or if someone did not do something well at first pass, even at second pass, assume that they didn't have the right resources and information. And so typically I approach it from like, how can we support you better? What are the what is the information that you wish you would have had? How are you going to do it differently this time and take like a coaching and supporter approach? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the number one way in the workplace to combat shame. The difference between shame and guilt is, um, to me, guilt can be a useful piece of information. It can inform that, you know, somebody did do something harmful and then that individual can go ahead and correct that harm or behavior that maybe wasn't, didn't turn out so well for the for those involved or themselves even. Mm -hmm. Whereas shame is like this perpetuating cycle of emotion that breeds those negative core beliefs that we talked about earlier in the show that um, makes you feel um, unworthy, that, um, uh, you know, really prevents you from growing and improving and reaching kind of like your maximum best self. And I think shame can almost be that like a he Achilles heel to progress and healing and becoming a better ver version of yourself. So I think in the workplace where employers or managers are really responsible for that is, again, just go back to really finding out and not making assumptions of why, um, you know, that individual in that task maybe fell short, support them all the way through, be an example and show them how to do it, and always be asking questions. And then also on top of that, always talk about what they did right. So, like, definitely look for the things they're doing well and doing right. And I think those are small ways that as employers um, or managers, people can really change um, people's perception about themselves. Okay. Um, and then just a little bit on affirmations. Um, you know, if I think uh, that I'm a bad and unworthy person, and then I basically wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm an awesome person, you know, and instead of thinking no one would love me if I am, I say, hey, you know, I am, I accept who I am. You know, the, does this simple affirmation work, and how does that work? Yeah, affirmations definitely work. Um, the one exercise, I mentor women um, outside of work and outside of entrepreneurship that are, um, you know, in, in recovery from a variety of things. And one of the exercises that's had a big impact on my life, but certainly I've seen it have an impact on women's lives as well, is doing, uh, this is pre-writing down affirmations because I think at first people really need to believe that they can be lovable and then they can go ahead and write the affirmations and repeat those or keep them in their pocket. But the first exercise that I really love um, that is sort of a precursor to affirmation is looking in the mirror and actually saying, I love you mm -hmm. and staring into the mirror for 30 seconds, looking at yourself. Cause if you think about it, you, you say, I love you to your family members, to your uh, person that you're dating. And you said, I love you to your friends and all of those things. But how many times does an individual, even a healthy individual, how many times have they spent actually saying I love you to themselves and like grooming that relationship? The relationship with yourself is the one you spend the most time with, but we don't actually spend quality time with it. And I've seen transformative experiences for people doing that type of affirmation to start. Some people um, have had a hard time even doing that exercise for the full 30 seconds for crying. Mm -hmm. But over time, what it's done is it started kindling this relationship with themselves that they've never had before. Mm -hmm. And then typically I task women to write down 10 things that, you know, 10, 10 affirmations about qualities that you believe that you have about yourself and read those whenever they're feeling trigger, uh, triggered or whenever they're feeling down. And the exercise around affirmations that I think is super powerful, and this is going to sound kind of funny where I got the idea for it, but there was a Dove commercial a couple of years back. <laughs> And um, it showed this, these women writing down the thoughts that they had in their head about themselves and then saying those out loud to people. And so I've also had this exercise of like, write down all of the thoughts that go through your head for a full day and then try reading that out loud to a friend or pretending like you're reading that out loud to a friend. You would never talk that way to a friend. And even people that have said, oh, I'm a positive person person whatever 
you will find out nooks and crannies of negative self-talk, I think, no matter how confident you appear to be. And then you have a data point by which you can start turning those thoughts. So next time that thought comes into my head about like, oh, I didn't do good enough at this thing, I can turn it on its head and say, actually, I did just as good as I, sh I needed to do, or I am worthy, or I am lovable. And so those are three different ways that practicing affirmations I have seen with my own eyes do transformative work on people. And it's free. So <laughs> Yeah, no, I was just thinking about the uh the other affirmation where you basically look in the mirror and say I love you. I'm sorry if it confused, thank you. Um, you know, I think there's like a proper name for that one. Um, you know, and it, it, I think it sounds kinda weird when you start doing that. But then once you get used to it, like because like you have to accept yourself too, right? I mean, I think right. by self accept I, I wrote a blog about this once, you know, by by accepting yourself, that's when you know, you accept the imperfections of other people, you know, because like, I feel like yes. no one is going to be perfect, right? Like you have like people right. that you work with, you know, you have your significant other, you know, they're not going to be who you want them to be like overall, right? So, right. you know, to, to actually know and say, hey, you know, like I messed up, you know, and forgive yourself, you know, by doing that, you also learn how to like accept other people just the way they are. Totally. Right? Totally. I mean, oftentimes, like if I'm if I'm feeling um, when I felt irritated or annoyed at something, it's usually because, yeah, I'm critical of that very own thing in myself. It always goes back to that. Very true. Yep. Awesome. So we have like about two minutes. So you know, before we go, like, do you have like a you know wisdom that you wanted to give to the Stanford community or, or the, the community in the Bay Area? Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. And I think the um, I've spoken to members at Stanford before. And I think there's a lot of great work that's actually being done in this very space. Um, and so I would just encourage the Stanford community to one from a faculty standpoint, continue the great work that you're doing in this space. It's very important work. But also maybe today, if you can uh, call your friend or if you see a classmate and just tell them that they're doing good today and give them a compliment and a smile. You never know how that can impact somebody. I think the more empathy we can spread throughout the world through our daily actions, um, the more we can actually slowly turn uh, this epidemic that we're facing with addictions of all kinds on its head. I think it really starts with small acts of kindness and just being more kind to each other and accepting. Sounds, sounds good. And um, so Stanford community and the community in the Bay Area, you guys are awesome. <laughs> and Daniela, thank you for being on the show. I uh, really, really appreciate you being here and sharing knowledge about addiction. I personally think that is, you know, an important discussion. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>